Signore e signori, buonasera, good evening, welcome to Casa Italiana, Zerilli Marimo, it's my great pleasure to welcome you here, ciao Angela, for this presentation of a fantastic exhibit that you cannot miss currently on view at the Museum at the Fashion Institute of Technology. I went Sunday and it was a great experience and it shows that you don't need hundreds of thousands of square feet of space to make an exhibit that is meaningful, intelligent, witty and fun. So go see it, it's mandatory. And I also like to welcome tonight the uh, students and the professors in the two classes that we're teaching at NYU this semester. One is on food, one is on fashion, and it's Laura and Roberto, are the teachers, and some of the students are in the audience. And this exhibit at FIT sort of combines the two things. These are two of the most popular courses in the Department of Italian Studies. No, no wonder, right? No, not a surprise. And no, it's, it's, a, it's a great exhibit, and we are very, we are very fortunate that um, Grazia D'Annunzio, our um, curator of the series Addressing Style, has invited the two curators of the exhibit, and that they're here with us tonight to talk about the exhibit and to explore the origin and how it's organized. And it's really an invitation for you to go see it with your own eyes. And of course, I would like to thank who is present here in the audience, Dr. Valerie Steele, who is the director of the museum at FIT. Please. <laughs> a founding mother of the field of history of fashion, can we say that? And uh, a, a great friend of the casa, and her generosity and availability is commendable. And what she has done for the promotion of the study of fashion at the academic level cannot be uh, underestimated. So thank you, Valerie, for what you've done and for being a friend of the Casa. And uh, as I said, we have the fortune of having with us the two curators of the exhibit, Food and Fashion, at the Museum at FIT, and I'm asking you to welcome them, along with Grazia D'Annunzio, Melissa Marra Alvarez and Elizabeth Way. Please welcome them. Hi, and welcome back to Addressing Style. I'm really happy to have these two brilliant curators with me tonight, speaking about a beautiful, interesting, uh, deep uh, analysis of the uh, controversial relationship between <laughs> food and fashion. Food and fashion had a long time fascinating relationship, but sometimes controversial, and as we can see, somehow disturbing. So I, this is the book. This is the book that came out uh, a little bit before the exhibition and it's published by Rizzoli and is a very interesting uh, analysis of uh, different aspects of uh, the relationship you know, for the fact. So I would like to start our conversation asking you, how did you come up with this idea and how long did it take to, did it take to put together the, uh, the show? So we've been working on this show since 2018, and the idea actually came from another exhibition proposal. Um, I thought about doing something about fashion in the five senses, and I proposed it to Valerie. And we talked about it, and she was like, you know, this is a little, this is a little convoluted. This is a little, um, you know, um, abstract. So think about it. And so Melissa and I had lunch that day, and we talked about it. And it was really over that meal where you're going back and forth. She was like, maybe you should focus on one aspect. Maybe it should be taste. And then we came up with food and fashion um, over that lunch. Yeah, Liz had this idea that as part of the five senses for taste, she wanted to have a bunch of garments that had food prints on them. And so as we were talking about, this light bulb went off in my head and I said, food, yes, we should do to taste food. And I said, I want to carry it with you. And so <laughs> <laughs> the idea was born from there. Good. So I, uh, before showing some uh, photos, uh, a photo gallery of, um, uh, in, of uh, you know, clothes that were inspired by food. Uh, you can stay up front. You can, if you want to take seats, uh, take seats up front, please. Uh, I want to ask Julian to show a clip of uh, uh, Marie Antoinette uh, by Sofia Coppola, a little clip where food and fashion relationships are very interestingly, uh, you know, addressed 
as a decadent pleasure uh, between the highest level of French aristocracy from the uh, 17th, uh, 17th century. And by that time, don't forget that uh, Paris was already known as the capital of haute couture and haute cuisine. So this is such a this is such an evocative clip, and I we speak about this in the book. There's a chapter that's devoted to haute couture and haute cuisine, and these are actually words that were invented in the 19th century to describe this emerging culture that was happening in the 17th and 18th centuries, really led by Louis the 14th. But we see it continued on. And what's so great about this clip is that you really make a visual connection between the style of food and the style of fashion, very much influenced by Rococo. And um, and actually, a lot of these kind of pastries, people theorize, mm-hmm. actually came to Paris for, with, with a Medici princess, so actually through Italy, um, is one theory that they have. But um, the way that Louis XIV was really trying to create a luxury export market was really focused on the protecting the silk industry and therefore the fashion industry, but also his promotion of a distinctly French type of cuisine. Food before that period had been very um, influenced by Asian imports. So we're thinking a lot of, um, and also like kind of this uh, classical Greek um, eating style that was based on medicine. So the humors, a lot of like cinnamon and nutmeg. And Louis XIV really embraced this new cuisine that was all about local French food. So we think about butter and shallots and things like that. And this type of food, this type of fashion really went on to dominate what was considered luxury in Europe for a really long time. There's, there's also one kind of funny little anecdote about the costume design for this film. Um, and the costume designer said that when Sofia Coppola um, was talking to her about the show, she walked up to her and she gave her a box of lottery macaroons. Mm-hmm. And she said, this is the color palette that has inspired the whole film. And so really all the costumes really take their inspiration from food. Yeah. And by the way, because we are at Casa Italiana, the costume designer was Milena Canonero, Oscar winner, <laughs> Number one. We actually really wanted the dress that she wears, but it was it's in Italy and over the pandemic. Yes. It was not quite practical to bring it yes. over. And the, the shoe that the shoes that you saw in that scene were designed by Manolo Blavi. Another great, great shoe designers and also a deep connoisseur of the 18th century. Mm-hmm. So uh, with this wonderful Moschino jacket, I would like to ask you how uh, fashion etiquette has been changing this, you know, last century, in this last century, yes. So this is a take on a dinner jacket. Um, Franco Moschino was so humorous and he loved kind of this surrealist whimsy. And so he's, his take on the dinner jacket is literally, you know, putting dinner on it. Um, but it really nods to kind of the etiquette around dressing and how it changed and modernized over the 20th century. We write about um, the invention of restaurants and really the popularization of restaurants and how it was a public space to eat. And so the food was very over the top and it's all influenced by French chefs coming over to the UK at first. And then we see it pick up in London, or excuse me, first in London, then we see it um, kind of carry on in a significant way in Paris and then New York. And it was all about seeing, being seen. So over the top dishes, like frog legs, but they'd be called thighs, the the thighs of nymphs at sunrise or like, um, (laughs) and then you'd wear your fabulous couture, couture gowns. And it was a place that was public. It wasn't a private club. It wasn't a private home. So the Nouveau Riche could come and kind of try and get into elite society. So it was a really important social mixing place and the rules of how to dress and, you know, the etiquette around food was, you know, all a part of being kind of socially having social currency. So next (laughs) So food, food motives on, uh, um, printed on textile are quite constant in fashion, but they became much more um, and more visible in the past 50 years. So why fashion has been so fascinated with food? Um, well, I think food trends, um, food, food trends in fashion as they relate to food come and go. Um, but I, at least... And for the past 10 years or so, we've seen kind of this momentum where we've seen more food references, um, not only on the clothes you wear, but on the fashion runways. And if we think about this, I mean, we all eat, we all get dressed. Um, And so there's this very inherent um, or this very base relationship that they have. Um, A lot of it is focused around identity. We 
a lot of our self-image is based on the clothes that we wear and the food that we eat. Uh, but what's really interesting is I think as food culture becomes more prevalent, um, it begins to infect fashion more and more. And part of that is because of social media. I think we're all out there showing pictures of our food, of the outfits that we wear. It's so much more in public consciousness. But food also becomes a really, really interesting metaphor for lots of topics um, that range from consumerism and consumption um, to, you know, um, ideas about gender and femininity, art. And so these are all like these kind of multi-pronged ways in which there's this marriage between food and fashion. And Melissa touched on this idea of social media. I think so many of these designs are made to be seen on these little screens and they want something that's impactful. They want something that's humorous, that's attractive. And so many of these really recent designs, Jeremy Scott for Moschino has been a huge kind of um, purveyor of these food themed designs are so based in nostalgia, things from our childhood, things that make us feel good, things that are comforting. Um, and so I think that has a lot to do with um, fashion taking up food. And then there's also the aspect, Liz, that like, Food on fashion is just fun. Um, you know, it's whimsical, it's joyful. And I think especially in like uncertain times when there's so much anxiety in society that these are just this little joyful bursts of relief. They make people smile. We've had people come into the exhibition and they walk and they're like, oh, it's so fun. But I, you know, I think we're kind of psychologically wired to see these things and they make us happy. By the way, the exhibition will be over on November 26th. So you have Plenty of time to go to the museum at FIT, which is closed on Monday and Tuesday. The rest of the week mm -hmm. is open and is free to the public. <laughs> <laughs> so very often, uh, fashion designers use food to express their identity and their uh, culture. So I would like to take a trip <laughs> all over the world to explore the gastro field of fashion and find out the uh, which kind of food and which type of cuisine had been chosen by the designers. So since we are here in the U.S., the first stop is <laughs> the diner. And uh, the, not only the diner, the most famous soda served in the diner, which is the Coca-Cola. So we have two images Great. that I would like you to comment. Uh, well, I think Coca-Cola is often associated as iconic Americana, right? Um, we recognize the logo. Uh, but in the 80s, um, in the midst of kind of like the Coke-Pepsi wars, um, Coca-Cola had some really successful ad campaigns. And so they were capitalizing on this and they actually decided to um, release a ready-to-wear line. And so there was a whole line of Coca-Cola logo merchandise. Um, and what a lot of people don't know is that the line was designed by then unknown designer, Tommy Hilfiger. Um, but, you know, these kinds of, these shirts have become iconic um, and in American culture, especially in hip hop culture. And so at one point, um, Heavy D and the Boys wore these Coca-Cola, this is a polo, but they wore sweatshirts um, in one of their music videos. And it just kind of became cemented as this kind of iconic garment. Um, and then Jason Wu also is like playing on this idea of Americana and Coca-Cola. Um, this was from the first collection that Jason Wu did, um, the fashion show that he had after the pandemic. And so he had been home, he had been thinking about um, food, food insecurity. And so the whole fashion show looked like kind of like a food market. Um, and he had a collaboration with Coca-Cola. Um, proceeds from the show went to a food bank, um, but he was thinking about classic Americana, the fun whimsical prints, and we have, um, there was another piece in this collection that had a bunch of Coke bottles on it. Um, not Coke. It was the logo of Coca-Cola that he went to the Coke archives and he researched that had Coca-Cola written in like several different world languages. Yeah. And I really love that update on this idea of Americana, even though Coca-Cola has invaded every corner of the world. He also is taking this idea of Americana and making it so kind of multicultural, um, you know, taking the logo and translating it to Chinese and Japanese and Arabic um, and other languages. Mm -hmm. The second stop in the U.S. is, I hope that you're going to hear me. I um, I hope so, but, you know, well, whatever. <laughs> sure. yeah. so we have to share them. The, the, the. But anyway. Uh, the second stop of our journey in the U.S. is the, the, uh, the hamburger joint. So <laughs> these are the three pictures I've selected that 
Melissa and Liz will, you know, comment for you. I think there's there's a lot of aspects going on here with these images, right? I think there is the kind of fun democratic appeal of fast food. Um, It's an indulgence for some of us. It's affordable for many. Um, And so this particular outfit that's on the screen now was um, the first collection that Jeremy Scott designed when he became the creative director for Moschino. Um, and so he's playing with the iconography of McDonald's in part, right? He takes the golden, the, the world famous golden arches, um, and he plays with them into and turns them into the Moschino logo. Um, but this was very much a collection for him that was playing on parodies between fast food and fast fashion. Um, and so he was thinking about this idea that fast fashion um, is really cheap. It's, it's produced inexpensively. It often re- like is copies of high fashion. And so a lot of the pieces in this collection were had these like Chanel-esque um, isms about them, right? There were these red and gold crop jackets. And so he's playing with those ideas, but it was also a commentary on just consumerism in general, which was something that Franco Moschino himself had played with throughout his career. Mm-hmm. And these, um, you know, this McDonald's collection was everywhere, especially the little cell phone case accessories. They were ripped off, like, you know, in Chinatown, we saw them everywhere. And even though he was really kind of thinking about consumerism, I think it really touched a nerve in terms of nostalgia, especially for, I think, for people our age. Um, But even a little older and a little younger, it was such a kind of fun kind of childhood memory thinking about McDonald's. And that's something we've seen designers around the world kind of tap into. Um, You know, we have pieces on display from a a Finnish company called Vane, and they did a show in... um, a set in a McDonald's made from upcycled McDonald's uniforms. And these are things that, you know, they might have consumed through television or other kind of forms of media about like American culture and like what it was like to have like a, you know, an idea like American childhood. And, you know, Demna Vasala talks about that, you know, growing up in Georgia and, you know, the Soviet bloc and how we just wanted a birthday party at McDonald's. So, you know, for all the evil or all the good of that, that was a, a message that really had legs around the world. And now the the vo, the little the vo, me the vo, yeah. These are Alex. these are funny because we have these as part of our graphic for the exhibition, and so when people see them, they pass the poster on the street. They're like blown up. They're huge. Um, And then when they come to the exhibition, they're like these tiny little leather um, and bag charms. Um, But these were, I think, Liz, these were probably one of the first pieces Mm -hmm. that we acquired for the exhibition. And this was a collection of bag charms that Delvo did. Delvo is a luxury leather house. Um, It has a long history. And so they did a collection of charms that were looking at kind of foods in different countries. Um, And so the French fries are for Belgium. um, And the hamburger is, of course, America. And uh, White Castle. So White Castle celebrated their 100-year anniversary last year, I believe. And so they did a lot of collaborations. Um, they did one with Telfar Clemens, who had thrown an after party uh, for one of, one of his fashion shows at a White Castle that had huge social media followings. And so they partnered with him to design um, uniforms for their 100 year anniversary. And they also did this collaboration with White Castle, or so, excuse me, with Puma, with these sneakers. And so we see these fast um, food brands really trying to kind of expand their consumer base, um, you know, and kind of borrow some of the prestige of fashion, even if it's kind of, you know, in a way that touches, you know, kind of the same marketplace. We see these crossovers more and more as a way to kind of co brand. Um, And so this was a really fun example. And I think um, co-branding is something that's so saturated right now. Mm -hmm. Um, Like so many food, like I think Panera Bread just came out with a baguette bag. They partnered with a fashion company. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) um, But we see this more and more. And I think what the appeal there also comes in the idea that often when you have these co-branded collaborations, they're limited edition. And so they work in twofold, right? On the one hand, you know, let's say um, Puma customers might, who maybe I weren't in, didn't know about White Castle or weren't used to going to White Castle, now get opened up to White Castle. And White Castle's customers who maybe coveted a pair of Puma sneakers or didn't know a pair of Puma sneakers are now buying Puma. Mm-hmm. Um, but the interesting thing is that they also kind of make this what's every day or the common feel elite. And I think that is a big draw for customers and why these co-branded collaborations are as successful as they are, even though there's so many of them. Okay, the second stop of our journey is Japan. (laughs) 
So this was also a really early acquisition. Mm-hmm. Melissa and I actually went down to the Miyake store. We saw an article about this. Um, he released this bento box of little accessories. They're rolled up um, hair accessories, uh, tote bags, and they but they're presented in this bento bag. So we will never unroll them. They will be stored <laughs> like this in our collection forever. Um, but he released this as um, for the 20 year anniversary of his store in Soho. Mm-hmm. And what I really love about this is that sushi has become such an ambassador for Japanese culture around the world. It's instantly recognized as Japanese, even though you can get it in a grocery store in like Minnesota, like you can literally get it anywhere now. Um, but it is still so kind of iconically Japanese. And so Miss Isimiyaki kind of playing on that cultural heritage, I think is really fun, especially to celebrate his anniversary in New York City. And this wasn't the first time that Isemiyaki or the Pleats Please referenced food. They had a whole ad campaign years ago that had like all these pleated garments that were shaped into ice cream cones and different kinds of foodstuffs. Okay, then we're going to move to China. So this is one of my favorite pieces. I saw this in the collection and you have to kind of look closely, but it's it's a beautiful piece by Han Feng and it's all silk jersey and it's printed with Chinese tea boxes. And what I love about this is it really envelops this idea of the Silk Road and that, you know, before, you know, the modern era, before, um, you know, the common era, luxury came from Asia and it came from China. That's just where nice things came from. And so, um, you know, for thousands upon thousands of years, these luxury goods were traveling the Silk Road. Silk, obviously, tea came a little bit later, but, you know, completely was obsessed. Europe was obsessed with Chinese tea. And so I think we kind of forget about kind of China's place in the the history of luxury and the history of fashion in that way. So I really love how this encompasses both of those historical aspects. And this is also a piece from the 90s, which was a time when, like, showing your cultural identity was, like, a really, was really, really um, full in fashion. Um, And so, you know, you're also connecting these things with time and place, right? Then we're going to move to Mexico and the Caribbean. So let's start with Mexico. I'll start with Mexico and you could do the Caribbean. Um, (laughs) uh, We have a section that looks at Mexico in general. And so this piece is partic- is looking at corn in particular um, and the idea of, of the role of corn in Mexican national identity. And in fact, in, in Mexico, there's a slogan, which is, I think, um, sin maíz, no hay país, which is um, without corn, there is no country. Mm-hmm. Um, and so this is a, by a, a Mexican-born designer who's based in New York now. His name is Ricardo Seco. And he was thinking about the role of corn in Mexican identity, but he was also thinking about corn as a bridge between cultures. And so the print of this ensemble um, references, he was thinking of Aztec culture, Mayan culture, and modern day Mexican culture. And so you have all these references in the garment itself and the way that corn can be a bridge between cultures. Okay. Caribbean. So this is actually an Italian designer named Stella Jean. Um, But the print that you see on this uh, fabric is yams. And she, every season, she's a Haitian and Italian. um, And she really kind of um, speaks to those cultural heritages through her work. This is a very famous design that she has that she refers to as wax and stripes. So we have the wax print um, associated with West Africa and then the striped business shirt that she associates with her Italian father, who's a businessman. Um, But every season she goes to a different location and and she um, partners with artisans to create new fabrics. And this was hand woven in Burkina Faso, which is um, kind of surrounded by all the largest yam producing countries in the world. And so we really think about kind of the way food travels um, through all of these different forces. And here we think about enslavement and how people were forced to move from West Africa to the United States, to the Americas. And yams were a food that followed them. Um, Yams were taken to Haiti to um, feed enslaved people when they were, they refused to eat, um, you know, at, and protest. And so they're force fed and they did want to give them foods that they would eat. So yams followed them over. And we have all of these yam dishes that exist in West Africa, that exist in the Caribbean, even the United States, we have candied yams in the South. Um, So it's a food that really traces kind of their diaspora. And so I really think that's a beautiful kind of aspect of incorporating it into this fabric, um, but also tells you so much history about the way, you know, even wax print itself is a, a fabric that, you know, was copied from Indonesia by um, the Dutch and sold in West Africa and now has become kind of a symbol of Africa. So how food and fashion circulate to represent culture, but also how they morph and evolve over time. And now it's time to go to Paris, to <laughs> Europe, move to Europe and go to Paris to the famous uh, Chanel supermarket show uh, for winter 2000. 
14 collection done in the Grand Palais uh, that was totally redesigned as a supermarket. So <laughs> tell us something. <laughs> <laughs> I think there is a lot of irony in this collection. Um, so yes, Karl Lagerfeld created this elaborate set um, that was a supermarket that had Chanel branded everything. So there was like Chanel pops and Chanel milk. Um, and the funniest part too was that there were all of these um, sale signs around the set of the runway, but instead of having something marked down, everything was marked up 80%, 50%. <laughs> um, um, I think this is also another commentary on consumerism, right? Um, Chanel fashion is exorbitantly expensive. Um, and he's, cre he's, treat he's giving it this very banal treatment, like shopping for Chanel is just as, as quotidian as, as shopping for, as going food shopping at the supermarket. Mm -hmm. um, and so there were all of these ideas that were, that were being played there. I think Lagerfeld even said at one point, life is a supermarket, shop. Um, but there is this um, idea of consumerism that's, and sh um, consumption that's really being driven home here with this set. And, and the way it was. And it had all of these lovely details. Like there were these um, shopping baskets that had the little chain and the tweed trim on them. There's also another really funny story. Apparently, after the show ended, um, a lot of the at attendees like flooded the, the runway or the set because they wanted to grab all of these like Chanel branded props. Um, of course, none of them, which they could take home. I think the only thing they could take home was the real food that was on the runway. <laughs> And in the same year, in 2014, uh, Jean-Paul Gaultier organized at the Fondation Cartier in Paris a lovely exhibition, very interesting exhibition about food and fashion uh, based on the arts of bakery and the craftsmanship of couture. I think this is such an interesting kind of art display because you think about artisanship and making, um, and also kind of the fundamental aspect of wheat and bread. And throughout kind of art history, whether it's um, expressed in textiles or other forms, you see these um, kind of odes to these cereals, these grains that really keep people alive. And so bread was so fundamental in this part of the world. And we see rice and corn in other parts of the world. And so I think kind of expressing fashion in this way is really, um, it really kind of breaks it down to the elemental parts of it. But something that's interesting that I'm sure Gautier didn't intend is this idea that cooking is domestic, sewing is domestic. And so these are things that are performed by women around the world until it's elevated to an art. And then it becomes a man's purview. When you start to make money, when you are now a designer or you're a chef, that becomes a male kind of domain. And we see this kind of throughout kind of the history of cuisine and fashion. Um, and so I think that that's a really um, unexpected, like unintended consequence of this, but thinking about who all of these objects that, you know, women yeah, touch right. all around the world. And, but the people who display it in galleries um, are rarely women. I, I, Liz, I think also there's uh, an aspect here that's talking about um, not only craftsmanship, but the um, ephemeral nature of fashion, because this is bread and it's not going to last very long. It's going to go stale. It's going to go bad. And so there's also these ideas that are floating around um, with installations like this. And now it's time to come to Italy <laughs> and uh, pizza and a glass of uh, red wine. <laughs> we um, have more. But, you know, <laughs> this is just the beginning. Um, this was something that I wrote about for the book. And it was a really, really fun chapter to write. It was a really fun chapter to see the way in which food played a role in the formation of Italy as a nation. Um, and this is, I think, something that stays um, throughout. And so when we see a dress like this, which is um, Moschino jean, so it was Moschino's lower price line. And this was the 80s. So this is when Italy was really pushing to make uh, Italian fashion way more accessible. Um, we see that Moschino is making these really witty puns here. So this is the lower price line. It's a dress that has food on it, but what does it have on it? It has pizza and Chianti, which are like more accessible, lower priced foods, right? Um, and then at the same time, we have the color play here, which is of course associating these foods with um, the image of Italy as a nation. And then of course, pasta. Uh -huh. Pasta, cookies. <laughs> And then we have some veggie option for the uh, vegan. 
uh, <laughs> Dolce Gabbana earrings and uh, headbands and uh, the, the very well-known Prada banana print. Well, I'll speak to the Dolce & Gabbana prints and you can take, yes. the, and you can take the Prada list. Um, I think when we think of fashion and food, Dolce & Gabbana is probably one of the designers that pops into a lot of people's heads because of the like very whimsical, fun food prints that they've done over the years. Um, pasta especially becomes this symbol, this like worldwide symbol of Italy as a nation that's identifiable anywhere. And so, of course, Dolce & Gabbana are playing with this, but they have never shied away from playing with um, ideas of Italy or Sicily um, that are in the popular consciousness. And so, of course, that ties back to food. Um, and they're whimsical and they're fun. But I also think that you know, when we were researching for the show, we came across all of these Ken Scott prints mm. um, from the yes. 70s that were all vegetables and pastries yes. and foods. And so I think they're also picking up on just a heritage of other Italian designers who are making food prints because they have that same whimsicality about mm. them. Yes. And uh, would you like to add something? For yeah, so... Uh, the banana skirt, this Prada banana skirt is inspired by Josephine Baker and the very famous, uh, you know, uh, the, the, review, the, the, the black review that she did. My French is terrible, so I won't um, attempt it. In 1925, and it was this huge watershed moment in kind of, you know, primitivism and this embrace of kind of black culture uh, in Paris. And it kind of spread out across um, the Western world. You can make connections to the Harlem Renaissance. Um but it was this very specific idea of what blackness was. I mean, she danced as this kind of like primitive African. This is a woman from St. Louis who spent her career in New York City and vaudeville. Um, and so you have all these conceptions around um, colonized bodies, black bodies um, that are so closely tied to the food of these places. Um, even though this is very conflated, like most, um, you know, bananas were grown in South America, but they were brought there um, from Asia. Um, but it's all wrapped up in this kind of this idea of the other. And so um, even though Josephine Baker is iconic and, you know, such a figure to be admired by so many, um, and I'm sure that's why Prada kind of picks up on this, there's also these really deep histories about why these foods um, are associated with certain people in certain places. And by the way, this is one of the best selling uh, mm -hmm. pieces of mm -hmm. that collection. Uh, for uh, the people uh, that there are Italian in this audience, I would like also to uh, point out this exhibition that um, initially took place in Rome in 2015 and then moved to New York at the Chelsea Market in 2016, organized by the Italian Trade Commission, is called L'Eleganza del Cibo, uh, Food Elegance, and the Elegance of Food. And uh, in this exhibition, they, I mean, they asked designers to uh, make specific dresses inspired by food. And uh, you have a couple of examples here by the House of Gattinoni. What's really great about this exhibition is you see some of these themes that um, Moschino was playing with, like in the 1980s and 1990s, um, you know, of wheat with uh, Jean-Paul Gaultier, which I think he did a little bit later, but you see wheat throughout. I mean, there are worth dresses. There are 19th century, 18th century dresses embroidered with, um, you know, ears of corn and wheat and all of these staple um, products, so or these staple foods. So I think it's... Uh, it's really beautiful that you see this continuity and people picking up on it over and over. And we were able to explore a lot of different themes, but certainly some of the themes that they look touch on as well. Yeah. And I think also just the simple fact of driving home this idea of um, Italian identity as it relates to food and fashion. Um, and it makes me, I think actually when you were saying that, it made me think of Right. I think it was in the 80s. It was the four F's, right? Yes. Food, fat, that was to promote Italian manufacturing. It Absolutely. was food, fashion, um, furniture, and what's the food, fashion and furniture. <laughs> food, fashion, and <laughs> just, furniture. Just <laughs> um, but this idea of promoting these objects and, or these, these things and as a form of soft power, as a form of, and so I think it's, we still see that going on, right? As recent as 2016. I never mm -hmm. saw this and it was just down I the know. block. Yeah, <laughs> no, I didn't see it either. But it's, um, it, I actually, it was an interesting discover. Also for me, because I was here in 2016 and I never been there. <laughs> so I, I mean, searching for this, this talk, I found out this. So what I found uh, particularly interesting in the exhibition that you co-curated is uh, your analysis of the phenomenon of sweets 
being traditionally associated with the idea of uh, femininity and the connection between food and gender identity. So I would like you to, you know, speak a little bit more in details about this topic. Um, one of the things that we kept coming up against, or we kept coming up on, um, was A, all of these delectable, like, little accessories and garments that had pastries or were all these like, scrumptious pink, you know, frosted inspired um, fashion and accessories. And so we would talk about what ideas behind them, right? Some of them spoke to ideas of femininity. Some of them spoke, a lot of them spoke to ideas of nostalgia. Um, we all associate sweet, like we all have fond child, many, we, most of us have child, fond childhood memories associated with pastries and cakes and events focused around sweets. Um, and so they tend to, to bring positive memories. And we weren't, you know, for a long time, we really weren't sure how how to organize this in our thematic exhibition. And so we played with a bunch of things. And, and then at one point we knew we wanted to have a sweet shop. And then one day it kind of just clicked, right? Um, I think ideas of gender and ideas of nostalgia are not completely separate from one another. Um, and so we often think of men associated with meat and grilling. And we think of women associated with baking and cupcakes and cakes. Um, and so we started playing with this idea. There are a bunch of designers who kind of go with that idea. There are a bunch of designers who push back against that idea. Um, and as far back as the Victorian era, you know, there was this kind of push to associate women with sweets. Um, at times, women's consumption of sweets was used as like a metaphor for their consumption of fashion. Um, but other times, um, it was just this idea of women consuming this vacuous, ca like empty calorie food, right? Um, and so all of these things were kind of swimming around in our head when we were looking at this um, and we were picking the pieces for this section. Um, and it's really, it's really interesting. There's so much great food scholarship that we've read, um, you know, when we were reading the book and we were doing the exhibition and these, the way women were kind of, um, viewed as like childlike, as like, um, with very little self-control. And so it all, it was all about how they were eating sugar and they were consuming fashion. And there was a really interesting article we read about how when candy companies wanted to start mm -hmm. marketing candy to men, they couldn't sell it in little bonbons, like the way mm -hmm. women ate chocolate. They needed a new shape. And so they came up with these candy bars that were supposed to be like more substantial, more <laughs> masculine, um, that they could market directly to men. Um, ironically, our candy bar is a baby Ruth with a woman's <laughs> name, but, um, although I think it was made for Babe Ruth actually. So actually very masculine, um, in its associations. Um, but we see these designers, um, you know, creating ideas about luxury and, or sorry, not luxury, like desire and consumption by dressing women up as sweets. Um, it's really kind of mind boggling. It's funny and it's like, and it's kind of sexy, you know, it's like, you know, something to be consumed. Um, but there's a lot of kind of, um, there's kind of like a lot of negative ideas about women kind of wrapped up in this as well. Well, and I and I think also, you know, sewing and cooking are both considered domestic activities, which of course for a long time were women's domain. And, you know, not only in the way the garments look, but actual fabrics, right, have food names sometimes. And they were named by women because they were taking these names from the from the kitchen. So the idea of like chiffon um, or red velvet. Um, mm -hmm. These are all textile names. There's like a tweed cake. Um, these are all textile names that come out of the kitchen. All right. Some fashion designers uh, were food, I mean, are and used to be food lovers mm -hmm. and uh, even published books like Christian Dior, who was, uh, uh, was fat, and, <laughs> <laughs> and the Missoni family. <laughs> and then more recently, we have uh, brands such as Dolce Gabbana who started collaborating with uh, chicken appliances um, uh, brands mm -hmm. and pasta makers. And not to mention, for instance, Prada. Prada bought a very famous uh, patisserie shop in Milan called Marchesi. The, the location is an historic location in Corso Magenta. And Prada opened also a couple of extra venues. And one of the, one of the two is in this picture, is in Galleria, in the famous Galleria. And in the art, you see the arch is overlooking 
the pro the 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 first Prada store that was founded in the teens in Milan. And uh, LVMH also in Milan bought a very famous a tea house called Coba. So my question is, do you think that internet and especially the Instagram craze made food more popular and therefore for fashion houses, it became a kind of, I become a kind of uh, necessity to be attached to food and to collaborate with food company in order to be cool and have more likes? I I think it definitely makes them more visible. Um, but I actually, I was thinking about this. You know, I think for a long time, we looked at like perfume as this way, to, as this like accessible way into designer labels and designer brands, right? Not everybody can afford Prada or Dior or Armani, but you can, you know, you can buy the perfume and you can buy a little piece of that aesthetic and that image. Um, and I think kind of that's what's happening with some of these eateries um, that a lot of fashion brands are putting out. It becomes A, a way to extend their brand aesthetic, um, B, a way to kind of cultivate the kind of customers that they want um, and see a way of becoming a little bit more accessible. Like maybe you can't afford the clothes, but you can save up if it's an expensive restaurant and go for a special meal. Or if you're visiting a, if you're visiting a city, you can go, you know, have a dine, dine out or go to the Prada cafe um, or eat some uh, Armani chocolates. Um, yes. And so I think it's a way to stay relevant, but I also, I kind of, I kind of think of it along the lines of the way designers would use perfume. Now it's like eateries. Mm -hmm. And something we saw on Instagram so much were people doing their own DIY branded food. So people would, you know, create a Fendi pizza. They'd burn in the F <laughs> logo into a pizza or they do um, the Chanel C's on a latte. And, you know, these spread around the internet like crazy. And I'm sure that people go into Chanel and be like, I want this latte. But this <laughs> is something that someone created like in their own kitchen. So I think it's savvy of them to kind of jump on this food craze, which is so huge on Instagram. And places like this, I admit I went there and I went to this cafe and had my picture taken. <laughs> um, but you know, it was full of people getting their pictures taken to put on Instagram. So it was... <laughs> It was really drawing in crowds. It's something new and experiential um, that, you know, again, like Melissa says, dr is accessible, draws in new um, customers. And, you know, hopefully I think for the brands will be a gateway to uh, future customers. But, but Gretz, I also think this is not something new. I think this idea of fashion and eateries or shopping and eating like goes back to early um, department stores or at places where you would shop and women would have tea rooms. And so you would have this space where it was fashion, it was food, it was interiors, it was, it was female driven. Um, and yeah. so I think there, this is just kind of an extension of something that started a long time ago and designers are just, you know, using it in a new way now. Okay. Next chapter. Food and fashion um, have featured a lot in art. Uh, but when uh, fashion started in, uh, I mean, last century, we, it was uh, actually uh, the, the, the time, the turn of fashion designers who started incorporating in their work some motives from art, like, for instance, this very famous Caparelli dress, the lady on the right is the Duchess of Windsor, and uh, the lobster dress was inspired by the, the famous Dali sculpture, the mm -hmm. telephone dress. Here we have some prints from Andy Warhol used by different uh, unknown brands in the U.S. in the 50s and 60s. This is uh, Andy Warhol. Campbell soup, paper dress, and this is a Comte de Garçon inspired by Archimonde. So, can you tell us a little bit how this trend, did this trend start, and how eventually it developed? Uh, well, I think the idea of food art, food 
art references on fashion is very much a 20th century phenomenon. Um, and so I think most of us, when we think of food and fashion, we probably think of the scap or who, Scaparelli lobster dress. I think that's one of the pieces that comes to our mind instantly. Um, and of course, this was not the own. So this was a collaboration between Scaparelli and Salvador Dali. And of course, it was not the only time they collaborated. They collaborated on several pieces, um, but it is the most well-known. Um, and so I think surrealism especially is really enticing to fashion designers. Um, it's this idea of taking something mundane and making it whimsical and making it fantastical um, that just lets the imagination play. And that's really fun for creatives. And I think designers get really drawn to that. Um, we also looked at some pop art you know, imagery. Um, I think there are so many connections there. Warhol, in the beginning of his career, was a commercial artist. Mm -hmm. um, and so he was doing textile prints. He was doing wall uh, wrapping paper prints, a lot of times anonymously. Um, and so these were, these speak to kind of the fun aspect of, a, of kind of food and youth and American culture. Um, but, you know, and then of course this, ex these experiences led to his later, you know, pop art, screen silk pop art works, um, which were holding a mirror up to you know, consumerism and capitalism in American society. Um, and I think pop art has the same kind of appeal, maybe that surrealist have for designers because it's bright colors, it's flashy, it's creative. Um, and so there is, there's just that very visual draw there. And I think what's really great about the Campbell's soup, super dress is that it's a product that Campbell's, the Campbell's soup company created, um, you know, capitalizing on their popularity through Andy Warhol. They created these paper dresses that you could send in soup labels mm -hmm. and like a dollar and get back and have these paper dresses. So it was a way that they were kind of, you know, turning, turning the tables on Warhol and, you know, making money off of his making money off of them. So I think that's a really, I think that's a really uh, fun aspect of these paper dresses. But I also think that, you know, in the fifties, especially, but going back to like Scaparelli, there was these designers who really wanted to have like an intellectual relationship with fashion and elevate it and make it, um, you know, make a connection to art, you know, make deeper connections to society. And I think art um, was one way to do that, but food was also a really accessible way into that. Um, and it was so, it was so whimsical and it was so strange and it got so much attention. Dali actually wanted to put mayonnaise on this dress. <laughs> um, he thought it would kind of complete um, the tableau and Scaparelli refused. Um, but it, I think there was a lot of like kind of ideas swirling around. Um, you know, there's so much symbolism in Dolly's work with the lobster, a lot to do with sexuality and women and men. Um, this is an infamous. Yes. Because that's yeah. And the fact of the way that the lobster is position. <laughs> and so the fact that the Duchess of Windsor wore it, I mean, I think this was part of her wedding trousseau that she was like elevating it to something like oh, yes. smart and sophisticated Absolutely. and like, you know, avant-garde. So I think that, um, there's a lot of ideas circulating. Well, and she she chose this dress because she was trying to change her image a little bit from being this dowdy woman into someone more adventurous. And so using this kind of surrealist dress, um, this using Scaparelli's work was a way of kind of making her seem more, I don't know, contemporary, but just not sort of to help her reputation in a sense. The Duchess of Windsor was a great fashionista. I mean, she supported fashion. She was dressed in Mabel Cher mm -hmm. when she got mm -hmm. married. I mean, she she was impeccable all the time. And, uh, and uh, by the way, the, um, a little, you know, little thing that I want to add, the paper dress. Um, at least talk about the, um, the, 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 the Andy Warhol paper dress. Yes, it was a paper dress. Paper dress were extremely popular. They were launched in the uh, 60s. And then they disappear. But <laughs> they were extremely popular. And actually, fly attendants mm -hmm. used to dress in paper dress. That was dispo disposable dresses. And uh, very colorful, very hygienic. And, uh, <laughs> so I like the idea. So um, now it's time to go uh, to the dark side of the street <laughs> and uh, explore some more interesting topics related to food and fashion. So food and fashion industries are the two biggest uh, wasted producing sectors of uh, our society, our world. So how fashion, you, uh, you know, in your, uh, you know, your, 
you think that fashion, fashion designers now are approaching sustainability? Well, one of the ways that um, we look at is the intersection of food, fashion, and biomaterials. And this is a really great example. Melissa, do you want to talk about them? Uh, well, sure. I was, you know, I was just going to say, I think also fashion is taking a lot of its cues from food movements, right? Um, one of the things that people talk about a lot are parallels between the slow fashion movement and the slow food movement, right? Mm -hmm. So focusing on quality over quantity, sourcing your materials locally, slow food and slow fashion both have a big kind of community spirit mm -hmm. around them, which is of course the very opposite of what fast fashion or fast food is. Um, so that's one way in which around sustainability in which they come together. The other way is through this use of new materials, right? And so fashion materials are driven by science and technology. And so now we see a lot of um, material companies that are coming up that use or harness food or food waste. Um, and so Stella McCartney, of course, has been a huge proponent. She's a big vegan. And so she doesn't want to use any animal products in her, you know, in her collections. And so these food waste materials are great. They, they become leather alternatives. They can be silk alternatives. Here we have, I think this bag was made from mycelium, right, Liz? Mm -hmm. um, and mycelium is mushroom. Well, it's the root structure of mushrooms. Um, but what's interesting here is that while you can't eat mycelium, what they, what they the way it's grown takes its cue from the food industry. So they're using um, uh, warehouses that restaurants use to grow mushrooms to grow this mycelium. And so these are all you know, they're making products out of them, but the reality is, is that these materials are all very much in their infant stages. Um, I like to kind of make the, the analysis, like a polyester one time was like a rare new material and now it's ubiquitous. It's everywhere. Um, the hope is, is that one day our mushroom leather, our pineapple leather, um, our materials made from apple waste or grape waste or orange peels, um, will be as ubiquitous as polyester is. And as they refine these technologies, because they, as I said, they are new, they will become more sustainable, more circular. And so it's this fashion industry or well, the fashion and food industry's way of trying to be, um, use science and technology to combat this waste problem. So Pina Tax is a, a kind of food waste based product that is a little bit further along than something like um, the mushroom leather. And so we do see bigger companies kind of investing in using it on certain lines. So these are happy pineapple um, Pina Tech sneakers that are also made with um, corks. So these are Nikes. Um, and, but these technologies also have roots in kind of indigenous knowledges and older technologies. So this is me, Tiero. Um, this t-shirt, it says it's made from milk. It's made out of spoiled milk proteins. Um, but there are plastics from the 19, the early 19th century that were used in the twenties and thirties that are also made out of milk proteins called casein. Um, we also um, have, you know, um, fish fish leather um, from uh, a Brazilian brand called Osclin that's using food fish mm -hmm. um, and the waste that's coming out of it to make it into these beautiful luxury leathers. Yes. Um, but we also have a 1920s dress that has um, uh, fish gelatin sequins. So we do have older technologies that are being refined. Um, and People like Stella McCartney are really important in this because they are willing to put in the R&D. It's so expensive to develop these things, make them um, work, make them um, function. At this point, things like this actually do have a lot of plastic, so they're not 100% biodegradable, but it really takes a lot of money to get that first step out there. And companies like Stella McCartney also have the not only the money, but the platform to help bring these materials and, and bring them into the public consciousness. Okay, in the past century... Um, fashion represented and always, always glorified a very skinny uh, female body that had to be skinny in order to be considered beautiful. And I selected here three major um, examples of models. The first one is Lisa Penn, who was the, uh, the, the, the wife of Irving Penn, tweet, which dominates the, uh, the 50s. Uh, 40s and 50s, late 40s and 50s. Um, Twiggy, who epitomized the 60s, and uh, Kate Moss, who was the icon of the um, 90s. So uh, not only that, then we have, for instance, Karl Lagerfeld, who published a book, a, a diet book, after he lost 92 pounds. And this is a picture of Lagerfeld when he was chubby and happier. 
<laughs> and just to finish, Oliviero Toscani uh, did this very infamous uh, advertising campaign uh, against anorexia. And he launched it during the uh, 2007 uh, shows in Milan in September. And because of the, uh, the subject, and that the model actually died a few months later, um, the, 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 the campaign was banned from public spaces and from all the magazines. So I would like to know more about what you think about this, the, the other side of uh, the funny, loving uh, love affair of uh, food and fashion. Uh, well, food, fashion has always had a really uneasy relationship with food. Um, and so I think you kind of see it go in two directions. On the one hand, there's like the thin ideal, which Grazia showed us the images of all of these models um, that are super thin. So it's like the avoidance of food, diet culture that's been marketed to women for centuries. Um, and then on the other hand, you have the fetishization of food, right? You have women gorging on food in unhealthy ways, or you have, you know, fashion spreads where you have these, you know, thin, beautiful models, and yet they're like shoving spaghetti and they're surrounded by cakes and hot dogs. And so it's like these two impossible ideals. Yeah. Um, a lot of fashion shootings, you know, for instance, at Italian Vogue, you had, I mean, I remember when I used to work there, uh, models having, you know, spaghetti and uh, <laughs> eat food. Think of Helmut Newton, for instance, also in the 70s, uh, models with food, with meat, you know what, uh, this kind of gluttony. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, we saw the image of Karl Lagerfeld in his diet book. And the irony there too is that he lost all that weight because he wanted to wear fashion. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so... He wanted to wear yours, man, uh -huh. you know, clothes. And, yes. and then he became completely fat phobic, which is like, you know, horrific. Um, and so how are we navigating this space today? Um, I think there are a lot of designers who are pushing back on this skinny body trope. Um, we have a piece that we look at in the book and in the exhibition, which is um, by the, the fashion label Chromat. Um, and Chromat, you know, is known for using models with body diversity, all different sizes. Um, we have a piece from a collection in which the Cheetos was like the center of the collection. And so the collection was in these bright orange colors and all the models came down the runway eating Cheetos. Um, but these were healthy body models. Um, and so I think that is, that is one aspect. Mm. And there's so much, I think like in fashion, we think about like models as like perfect and having embodying this discipline, this bodily discipline and this control. And so I think being thin is kind of a uh, a symbol of that control. And there's such amazing scholarship, food scholarship that talks about, you know, how women, these nuns in like, like the 16 and 1700s, they would like fast and they would have like this, um, you know, they would have these hallucinations and talk to God and everything, but it was <laughs> like controlling their body, controlling their appetite, made them holy. And so you have these ideas about women that filter through about what it means to be, um, you know, to, to engage in things that are bodily, that are like, you know, that are kind of of the everyday. And, and you see this kind of fear come out with these fashion editorials where people are gorging and things that they turn like, they kind of play on this disgust because it's so taboo and like so adverse to this idea of control. So there's so many like interesting ideas wrapped up in, you know, why this is happening. But a great scholar, Emma McClendon, who does a lot of stuff on kind of body, um, image in fashion. She wrote a chapter in our book about this. Um, and she wanted that image, um, from the campaign and she absolutely like no one would license that image to her. Um, so it was really interesting, um, how that kind of became this became taboo. Mm -hmm. Um, but there are brands that are kind of working against it, but there's still so much, so much of that old kind of mentality as well. Um, that, and there's so much fat phobia in this world about, and it, I think it oh, does yeah. have to do with like control and like, you know, lack of control. Okay, I would like to finish our conversation on a lighter note. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I selected a couple of three, four uh, pictures of celebrities dressed in food uh, costumes. <laughs> so we have here Gaga in the famous Nicola Formichetti, disgusting uh, <laughs> meat dress, <laughs> real meat dress. And then we had Mariah Carey. <laughs> Dress as Oreo, 
And then Gwen Stefani as an act. Kathy Perry as Kiros. And I, this I love. This is Katy Perry at the um, uh, post uh, Metropolitan Gala uh, party in 2019 as a hamburger. So, could you explain this kind of funny and somehow Halloweenish trend? Spectacle. <laughs> attention grabbing. Um, yeah. But I think, I mean, I think we have really varied examples here. And for example, the Lady Gaga meat dress, right? That was, I mean, on one hand, it was, I think she had appeared a few days before in a magazine and she was also wearing a meat bikini. But I think the meat dress here, on the one hand, it feels almost like this performance art piece, right? But then on the other hand, I think it's also about activism and protest because when this was for the MTV Music yes. Awards, right? Um, and I think that year she had came escorted by all these members of the military who had been discharged um, unfairly because of their sexuality. And so um, a few days later, she gave a speech and she said something about like, equality is the prime rib of America or equating this idea of meat after there had been all of this media who blabbed or of her, of her meat dress. And there was a feminist artist, I think in the sixties or seventies who would dress in meat in kind of a similar way. So I do think she was looking at performance art as inspiration. Mm -hmm. um, it's funny, this, this dress is preserved at a museum. I don't know if it's the rock and roll hall of fame or something, but it's literally been turned into jerky <laughs> and is preserved. Um, <laughs> You know, probably frozen. Yeah, it's. Yeah. I've seen pictures of it, and it's like desiccated. But um, but yeah, this has been. Artifact. And then we have the Katy Perry, who I think she's wearing Jeremy Scott mm -hmm. in that yes. photo. Um, and that's Jeremy Scott uh, by Moschino. Mm -hmm. And who Moschino? Sorry, by Jeremy Scott. <laughs> but Jeremy Scott, in general, even for his own line, loves to use food references. I think he has like a whole TV dinner ensemble that feels more like a costume than fashion. Mm -hmm. um, but. You know, I think this was for the camp exhibition. And so, yeah, it's like this idea where food just fits into so many different niches um, of it's just such a part of everyday life. It becomes a perfect metaphor for so many different niches um, of our culture and our society. And so that's why, you know, again, that's why it's become so prevalent today. And I think there's like an element of individualism when there is a pasta print puffer coat that was written up in the New York Times earlier this year, but designed by Rachel Antonoff. And it was very, very popular. And, you know, all the, the reporters equating it, you know, to Gen Z and how Gen Z wants things that are individualistic. And so they were saying food prints are the new florals because, you know, florals are passe, but like food is what makes you stand out. And I think that there's a big element of that in these uh, kind of spectacle um, appearances. <laughs> Okay, now it's time to have a burger or a pizza or whatever. <laughs> Thank you very much for being here. And if you have a questions, please, Liz and uh, Melissa will answer. So, yes. So I think when this, oh yes. Yeah. So um, she was asking about the trademark, specifically a trademarks of food brands, specifically in relation to Jeremy Scott's um, McDonald's inspired brand. And when that collection came out, I think there was a lot of, there was an idea that he was kind of this rebel um, in fashion. This was his first collection for Moschino um, and that he was doing something very um, kind of um, out there. In fact, um, Moschino approached McDonald's and asked for permission to use the logo. Um, and uh, I believe that McDonald's asked Moschino to make a very hefty contribution to their charity. Um, in exchange for that. So it was seen as kind of this like um, this really rebellious move, but in fact, they did ask permission because of course they have a lot of lawyers at McDonald's. Yeah. Oh, someone's back. Yeah. Hi. Oh, you have the... Um, some biomaterials do, yes. Um, oh, sorry. Uh, yes, yeah, sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Did you asked. I did, you, did I do something? Oh, no. Okay. All right. You had asked the question about all these food based materials 
um, that are making their way into the market and into people's homes. And the question was, are there some, or if they make their way into museums, let's say, are there special care that they need? Um, are there, you know, because these are materials made from food. Um, some biomaterials do. I think the ones that are on the market now, they are actually coated. They have plastic coatings on them that help keep them um, that helped them keep their shape or, you know, so I think that they have some of the same properties of degrading that, uh, you know, plastics might have. Um, but I think the idea down the road is to become less reliant on these plastic treatments that, that these materials have and to find a way to stabilize these materials so that they can live um, a long life in our collections. I did a show a while ago and we had a biomaterial from algae. And I remember there was this conversation, like, can we have this in our collection? Is this something we want? And it was no, because it was too volatile. At this point, it was still too volatile. So a lot of these are experimental, but I think the ones like that Stella McCartney's doing that Pena Tex uses that make their way onto the market do have a level of stabilization to them. Yeah. So the question is, is Carmen Miranda mentioned in the show? Um, we, uh, there is a Carmen Miranda Museum in Brazil that does have her costumes. Um, we were not able, again, because of COVID, it made loans very, very um, difficult. Um, but we do include her on a screen. Um, there's a, a screen that talks about the colonized body, and it's all about bananas. So it's the, a clip from her singing the woman in the tutti frutti hat. It's Josephine <laughs> Baker, and it's Chiquita Banana. And we talk about how um, these these um, kind of plantation crops are like put on the bodies of women of color. And Carmen Miranda actually borrowed her act from um, Black Brazilian culture. Um, and it's something she really became famous off based on, um, you know, these women who were much more marginalized than she was. Um, I believe she actually might be Portuguese. She is Portuguese. She's Portuguese and then came to Brazil and then to the United States. But she was looking at Black Brazilian culture for that. Um, so it's a really interesting dynamic when we think about um, – kind of these plantation crops and how they've circulated around the world. I think there's someone in the back. Yes. Oh, well, I think... Repeat the question. Oh, sorry. <laughs> how would a student today pursue an internship in the field of fashion and sustainability? Um, I think you... Approach these companies um, and send your resume. Ask if they have internship programs. There, it's. I think there are so many companies now, especially young, like new new fashion labels that are emerging that are taking to heart um, this ethos of sustainability, not just in terms of the environment, but in all its forms. Um, and so, I think the best thing to do is just to go out there and call around um, and see who is taking interns or who might have internship opportunities. And then of course, I'm sure on campus at NYU, there's internship um, offices that help with those. But I think calling designers and just really going out there and knocking on doors is one way to, to help see what's out there. And I think every fashion program that's operating today is, has to turn an eye to sustainability. I know our master's program, um, sustainability is a big part of the curriculum. So I think that it's being worked in, in, you know, in real significant ways into fashion education moving forward. There's also lots of organizations that are centered around sustainability and like um, bringing communities together. That could be a good place for volunteers or for internships. If you want to like a fashion entry that way too. Thank you. Oh. Thanks. <laughs> Melissa, thank you. It was great. Thank you all for being here.